Welcome to our first Visiting Artist Series lecture of the semester slash 2023. Um, I'm so glad to see all of you here. Um, just as a kind of heads up, we do have two more lectures um, coming up in March and in April. Um, so keep an eye out for that. We'll send out emails. Um, but yeah. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to welcome Alex Chitty to campus this week. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about Alex. She lives and works in the Chicago, Illinois area. Uh, she is represented by Patron Gallery and has worked with students, educators, institutions locally throughout the U.S. and abroad, including the MCA, Horticultural Society of New York, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, Palau Coral Reef Research Foundation, Belize Marine Reserve, Oxbow School of Art, and the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, Alec just closed a solo exhibition at Pat Patron Gallery this past week. Um, hopefully some of you got to see it, it was a great show. Um, and I was excited to bring Alex to campus because of her unique transdisciplinary perspective, specifically her background in biology and fine art, work in multiple fields and diverse teaching practices and experiences, and I'm really excited to hear what she has to share with us. So please help me welcome Alex. My partner and I realized that if you stand in an empty field and you just raise your arms up into the nothing, it actually helps you feel better. So you just sort of stand there, and I'm going to do that again, and if you could just do that one more time, that would really be nice. <laughs> All right, so, um, hi. Thanks so much for being here today. My name is Alex Chitty. Um, I always like to start these lectures by reminding people that this is not my medium. I'm an artist, so I make a lot of stuff by myself in a room. Okay, <laughs> let's begin. Um, I've been invited here today to talk to you about my job. Uh, part of my job has now become uh, getting up in front of other people and trying to find the language that best describes. I watched a YouTube video on how to get it out of there. Um, is that better? Oh, now I gotta hold this, and this, and do that. Here we go, multitasking. This is actually part of my job. Um, so yeah, part of my job is getting up in front of people and figuring out how to talk about what my job is. Part of my job is making things and learning how to make things. But before I can get there, a part of my job is thinking about pretty much everything and then hyper-focusing on a few specific things and reading a lot about it and talking to a lot of people and being by myself and thinking about it some more. Because I do all of those things, I'm often invited to coach other people on how to make the things that they invent in their mind, teaching. Another part of my job, Oh yeah, another part of my job and one of the biggest parts is to navigate how exactly to support myself financially through the work I do as a female identifying Chicago-based artist in Chicago. Hey, Siri. I like to say that my medium is matter. That's not matter, that's my family. <laughs> Um, I like to say that my medium is matter. So my practice is often described, and I described it, and so did you, as transdisciplinary um, or interdisciplinary. And that's not actually totally accurate for me. Um, it would be more accurate to say that I'm an artist who uses anything on earth that has or is made up of atoms. So separating disciplines from one another is the way we learn to do things in academia. I guess I don't need to be here. I guess I can move around. Um, but it never really made sense to me in the way that my mind works, right? So, because I always use one discipline in order to educate myself about another discipline. So, that doesn't always work 
when I was in school, I got a, a, um, a scholarship to go to Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. And I worked with three different advisors to devise a, a triple major in biology, fine art, and education. I wasn't trying to show off. I just couldn't get into any art classes if I declared my major as a biology major. And then I couldn't get into any of the biology classes I wanted to unless I took some really insane chemistry classes up front. And so I designed a curriculum um, that suited me a little better. Um, the way that I understand the world is through observation and experience. So in order to learn about biology, I had to take some art classes so that I could better draw them because when I draw them, I see them better, I understand them better, and I have more questions about them. So I had to get into those art classes in order to better understand the biology. Oh yeah, so this is where I first learned to translate the knowledge of the living world into something visual. The other component of my education, um, this is my family. My slides are a little bit out of order. I did this to myself, but this is part of my job too, is maintaining my tribe. So making sure that my body's okay and that my well-being is okay. And this is a part of everybody's job, but we don't really talk about it at all. Um, so here's some atoms. This is the view from my backyard, like looking out of the back door of the house that I grew up in into the backyard. I grew up in Florida. Um, the other component of my education comes from growing up in Florida and comes specifically from my mom when she was raising us was also working uh, as an interior designer. And so she would bring me to the thrift stores and the flea markets and the antique stores to try to scout while she was scouting out objects for people's homes. And so it was in these places and in the homes of her clients that I began to understand that objects speak for us. Um, that by placing an object next to an other object, we begin to make some kind of meaning. And that by placing these objects in a context, um, they can begin to speak about our belief systems. Does that make sense? I always loved in teaching when you come in in the morning and you're like, good morning. And nobody says anything and you're like, oh my God, am I even here? Um, but that does make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, so this is why anything and everything ha that has matter has the potential to be my raw material. So I can, these are some images when I, when lockdown started, I tried to figure out in my studio what the heck I had all these objects for and I started to document them and photograph them so that I could begin to kind of create a network between these objects and understand the repetition, which ones was I, which ones were I, was I collecting over and over again? What colors were present? So these are just some of the objects that I had. And it's not that all of these end up in works. As it turns out, a lot of them are just uh, links. They're like thought nodes or website links, right? That things that make me think about and remind me of the things that are important to me. So anything can end up in my work. Um, one second, I need to find this one spot. Okay, so we're gonna jump around with the slides because I think this might have been an older version of my slides. So this is me improvising. Um, so. anything on earth that has atoms, whether it's an object that's made by an animal or a force of nature or a thing that's made by a force of nature and then shaped by a human or a thing that's face made by a force of nature and then shaped by an animal or a mass produced human made object or something my grandma made. All of it I can use. So I use photographs. It doesn't mean I'm a photographer, I don't think of myself as a photographer, but I have to learn how to be one in order to be able to make the kinds of photographs I want to put into my sculptures. So photographs, metal, here's another photograph. I needed to use a 35 millimeter camera just to get that texture that 35 millimeter film gives you. And then I wanted to do a really dumb digital move that lets you jump through time into the present contemporary day 
And then I used the, the woodworking and I made a frame that would specifically highlight that one dumb moment. So this is a sculpture, but it has a photograph in order to be one. More photographs, this is actually a print, a small etching, a photo etching. And I'll go back through these and explain a little bit about these works, but I'm just kind of running through what the materials are. So here's wood, spoons, there's shoelaces in there, there's petri dishes, ceramics, ceramics, spoons, ceramics, tables, cups, Shoes, other people's art, tabletops, shirts. So let me walk you through what these are. So I'm sure it's confusing because these are, you're looking at photos, but they're not photos. You're looking at photos of sculptures that have objects in them, and some of them are photos of photos that are inside of sculptures. So I'm gonna just walk you through backwards some of these. These are all works, I think, I'll let you know dating from when. This is just from last year. Um, so this was in the show that you mentioned at Patron. A uh, found tabletop and a shirt that I had been holding on to for like five years. I knew it was going to go into art. I never wore it, but I couldn't figure out how to make the thing until recently. So this is, um, I said I use other people's art. This was a show I had in 2019 right before the pandemic um, at uh, using Calder's work, and I was invited to sort of collaborate with his work, which is part of the collection at the MCA. Um, my mother, when we did go to museums, was always getting in trouble for blowing on the calders. Uh, she, my, both my parents are British, and so I'm not like making up a weird accent. This is just how she talks. But so she would blow on the calders, and then she would get in trouble from the security guards, and then she would be so apologetic, and if you're English, you can get away with that kind of stuff. And so she'd be like, oh, so sorry. And then they'd walk away, and she'd look at me, and she'd be like, but that's what it's for. Um, and then she would do it again. So I wanted to put an industrial fan on the calder that is always hanging in the MCA, no matter what exhibition is up, this calder is always there so often that you almost never see it anymore. And they wouldn't let me, so I hired somebody to fabricate an exact replica of it, and I called it Zebo, which if you go onto Amazon, um, you can get Zebos. They're like a placebo pill, but it's a, an honest placebo pill. And scientists have done research to find out that even if you know that it's a placebo pill, it still works. So I called it Zebo, um, and then I put this industrial fan on it. So it was just like really dancing the whole time. And uh, kids would walk in and just like lose themselves in watching it for the first time. Um, these, this is a fragment from a 2015 show that I did where I essentially took everyday furniture that you would see in a space and sort of abstracted it slightly. Same show. Which one's up there? This one uh, was from the last exhibition as well. Kaylee, those little spoons. So sad. And I like to use gravity a lot. I like to use the idea of things that you can't see, like the wind in the Calder sculpture being some kind of uh, invisible power, or gravity always being there, but you're never really thinking about it. And then this, just sort of the idea of repetition, and citrus comes up a lot in my work because I'm from Florida, but also it has a very distinct exterior and interior. The act of expelling it is a kind of expression in the same way like I'm trying desperately to do all the time as an artist. And then also those ceramics and are not mine. I don't make some of these things, right? I think of them or I think of the thing that I need and then I find the people that can help me either find it or make it. So these ceramics are made by an artist named Noah Singer and he's also a really good friend of mine, and so I can come up with a crazy idea and make him a drawing, and he can help me out. And sometimes we make exchanges of, of work, and sometimes he just does it because he's my friend, and sometimes I pay people, depending on how well I know them or how well they know me. This was a really early piece. This was the first time I did sculpture. It was mostly to impress a partner I had at the time because I didn't know how to weld, and so I was trying to, you know, but actually, the truth is I had been trying to do that for a long time and couldn't, didn't have the time to learn um, and didn't have the resources to learn. And so I was, uh, 
I was buying stuff on a credit card from Crate and Barrel, their shelves, and then I would have an exhibition and then I would return the shelves, um, just as a way to make things that were bigger than I could afford at the, t at the time to make in terms of materials. And this was a really, really early piece. This was 2015 too. But this is where my head was. I was thinking about sculpture, but at the time, again, I didn't have a lot of space and I was thinking about how to compress physical things into a small space, almost like if you took a PDF of a sculpture. And so I pushed them into the space that a painting would inhabit. This is from 2019, part of a suite of three. And 2016. Okay, I just wanted to expand on those a little bit. Because sometimes it's hard to know if you're looking at a photo or a thing. All right, so this is a piece from my most recent exhibition. And I told Mara, by the way, thank you, Mara Baker, for having me here today. And thank you. The Belushi Theater? This is great. Um, and also, thank you for helping me with technical things. I really appreciate it. Um, so I said that I don't talk about current work because I realized um, that often when you make something, you're encouraged to talk about it right away. And a lot of the times, I just met the thing. And so I don't really know how to talk about it in the way that gives it justice. And so I decided not to anymore. Um, but today, I'm going to talk about this piece a little bit, um, but more so for what we're looking at. I'm going to stay up here, not fall down there. So um, I used a used tabletop. That's the wood that's behind there. You can see a little bit of markings, traces of people having used it in the past. What's up front is this metal grid. Um, I got the grid pattern by drawing it with a Sharpie on a piece of paper. I turned that into an Illustrator file. I sent that file to a water jet place and they cut it out of sheet metal. I then rusted the sheet metal by watching a YouTube video about how to do that with vinegar and hydrogen peroxide. And then I made some hardware both to hold up that shelf and on the side there, which I powder coated um, at my guy, my powder coating guy that mostly does like uh, race cars, um, but takes breaks sometimes for me. Um, and then that's holding a tuning fork that I got from a music store downtown. Up at the top, I made this um, shelf and the whole thing is held together by, I just had 98% of my job is figuring out how the hell to get things to stay on the wall. Um, you just don't think about how things hang on the wall when you get an idea, but it's become a really huge part of what I have to do. And so I design it, I draw it, and then I hire a fabricator for this particular one to help bend the, the rod and weld it. And then I took it to a chromer, like the way you take a bumper to a chromer, and I had him chrome it so it would be shiny. And then up at the top, on that textured shelf, I put three lemons. None of them are really lemons. They're stunt doubles for lemons. They're actors. They become lemons because of their relationship to one another and because of what your brain does when you look at them. Because you've seen lemons before, and so your brain is making connections between the lemons you've seen before and these things up here. There's a ceramic lemon I got at a thrift store. There's a clump that I made when I was learning ceramics, and there's a poof that I made out of uh, some thread and wool. So I'm not using lemons because I need something yellow or because I'm making work about lemons. What I'm really talking about is in the context that I've constructed around the lemons. The specific materials, the objects, and the words in the title are all intentionally placed next to one another. They are the equivalent of what brush strokes are for a painter. They're gestures that contain and express what I'm observing, thinking, and feeling. So looking at my work is, and looking, like, looking at a lot of contemporary artists' work, is like learning a new language. It takes time and curiosity and a willingness to engage both in what I'm showing you, but also with the thoughts that are coming through your head while you're experiencing the work. A friend of mine described my work as like meeting a person, because you sort of see it for the first time, you get all kinds of ideas about what you think it is, and then when you meet it again, you learn a little bit more, and you learn a bit more, and it sort of shapes. The shapes change, they shift. So 
I see paying close attention as the first step of any kind of social change. Um, those are the poofs. See the poof, the clump, and the lemon. So I've been deeply influenced by people, make creators, uh, chefs, writers, um, BMX riders, um, strangers, train drivers, fashion designers, people who make you experience the world, perceive the world slightly differently than you had before you saw their thing, heard about their thing, tasted their thing, learned about the thing that they're passionate about. Um, but because this is an art talk, I thought that I would show you some pieces of artwork specifically. And these are not necessarily artists that I love or hate. Um, they're just specific artists, art moments where I saw some of their work or I saw an exhibition of theirs and it changed the way I understood how art functioned. Um, do not be fooled into thinking that art is non-functional. So this is um, after an exhibition in 2014 in New York City, before I had gone to art school. Is that true? After I had gone to art school. Um, so seven years after I had gone to art school, I saw this exhibition and then I walked out onto the streets of New York City and it was the day before trash day and the place just looked beautiful. I was obsessed with the trash. It didn't look like trash anymore. It looked like some magnificent series of decisions that someone had made. Then there are objects that, like the power is not in the object, the power is in the way the artist is thinking and has then chosen the object for us to think about the object. So this is Felix Gonzalez Torres, Two Lovers, somewhere in the 80s or 90s this was made. Essentially the idea is there are these two mass-produced clocks side by side, the battery is put into each at the same time and slowly over time, they get a little bit out of sync with one another. And this was speaking at the time to his lover who was dying of AIDS. So this is like personal loss and just life. Uh, when I started teaching at the MCA, I was doing tours of artwork for school groups age eight and up. And that's when I really started to understand how art functioned because it was the first time I saw people see art. Um, and they were preparing for an exhibition about the 80s, art in the 80s, and it had these two clocks before they had been put on the wall. They were just sitting on the boxes, leaning against the wall, and it broke me into a thousand pieces that I'm still trying to put together. Rachel Harrison, this piece really pissed me off the first time I saw it, because I felt like she was making fun of me, because I was looking at it and I didn't really know why those things were there, and I thought that I might be dumb and I was mad at her for telling me that I might be dumb. And then I looked at it some more, and over time I realized that this is like the language, right? She has a logic, and she's following it, and it's her own, and she's being very careful about how she says things, and it's on me to kind of dig a little bit deeper than surface level stuff and really try to ask questions and figure out what she's talking about. Um, this is name. Gabriela Orozco, so this is a photograph of, yeah, I tried to get a good quality of the picture of this, it is so hard. So this is a very pixelated image of a Gabriel Orozco photograph of breath on a piano. Just like, the way that photographs can help us preserve the things that don't last on their own. And then, I think I have a Tillman's Again, same thing, could not get a good image of this. Both the photographers, they don't have high resolution images online. Interesting. Um, but Wolfgang Tillmans is another one where the things you're looking at, you're like, psh, psh, it's like nothing moments, right? But how many nothing moments make up a day, a week, a month, a lifetime? like a billion of them. And so in the end, these nothing moments end up being kind of what life is. And this is another example, like the Felix Gonzalez Torres clocks. Uh, this is Jason Dodge, and these are three dumb pillows, right? Three dumb pillows stacked in a room, the rest is empty. It was in an exhibition about minimalism. 
And the title of it is beautiful, and I didn't write it down, so you should look it up. Um, but essentially, when you read the title, the title is part of the material, and it lets you know that actually there was a basically a geophysicist that slept on the bottom pillow, and then an anthropologist that slept on the middle one, and then a botanist that slept on the one on top. And only they slept on those pillows. And you start to think about, like, well, dude, like, what, what does a botanist dream about? And then you start to think about, like, how do we collect all this knowledge? And then you just start to roll out. So a lot of these kinds of objects are relying on, are relying on you to bring them to life. Um, and I, I think there's a generosity here. Um, there's like an assumption that the audience will do that and that they can do that in a way that perhaps with minimalism in the 50s, we didn't even show you a representational image because we didn't think that if we showed you an image of an apple, you'd be able to think of anything other than an apple. But I love, I think seeing these artists um, and these kinds of experiences that make you take what it is you're looking at and think about something other than what you're seeing is really what influenced my, my work a lot. <laughs> yeah, this is an old slide, so here's some onions. <laughs> um, so essentially what I'm saying is that things like people are really complex. Um, and there's what you see up front in the foreground, and then there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on in the background. Many of my recent sculptures are wall-based. They inhabit, this is my dog, digging. Um, and I, I sign off a lot of my emails with my students just saying, keep digging, because it's essentially what it feels like to do my job. Um, you just go and go and go until you find some piece of treasure, and then when you find the treasure, you're not done, because you're like, oh man, I found some treasure, there's probably more, and you keep going until you're old. Um, and then you keep going. So many of my sculptures are wall-based. They inhabit the physical space where we're used to viewing paintings, photographs, windows, or computer screens. So I'm relying on that habit that you already have built for yourself. But unlike traditional paintings, these works don't have a single point perspective. They require a non-passive viewing experience. The way you gain information is accumulative as you move around the thing or find things that are hidden behind other things. And because I use real things or mimic things from the real world, it may seem familiar at first, as though you've seen it all before, but the act of looking closely leads to a re-examination of what you thought you were looking at in the first place. So much of our world has been pre-categorized in a way that makes it feel as though there's nothing, nothing left to learn about a thing or an idea. And so it's easy to think that if we don't know everything about a thing, there's probably someone out there that does, and so really, what's the point? But if you line up who has historically been invited to learn about, interpret, and relate their understanding of the world to the masses, and if you don't see yourself in that lineup represented there, that means that it's definitely important that you, specifically you, go ahead and give it a shot. So these days, when I find my mind revisiting the same thing over and over and over again, I've stopped trying to figure out why and how it relates to everything, and instead I've tried to lean into it. I've learned to recognize when mental repetition occurs. It's similar to the way that boat fishermen use flocks of birds over the sea as a sign, um, a, a way a way that they know that what it is they're looking for is there, just under the surface. So I'm hoping, essentially, that uh, DuPage College, can I hear you say what, what? Can I hear you say what, what? I'm hoping that if anything, in the process of talking about my job and the way that I've decided to speak about it today, that you leave with the full knowledge that you can honor your own idiosyncratic interests and then the work follows after. All right, let's open this up to some questions.
How do we do questions here? You just yell at me? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I've seen some humor in your work. Uh, do, you, do you see humor in your work? I'm a very serious person. Oh. <laughs> do you intend for sometimes to make something humorous? Or do you, do you see the humor sometimes? Do you see what a humor in your work? Or do you see it like after you make it? Or do you sometimes see it as you make it? Or do you see it before you make it? <sighs> I've been thinking a lot about humor. I know that when you think about jokes, it makes them not funny anymore, but, um, so the, the, the short answer is yes, it's there. Um, that is my coping mechanism in life. It's one of my survival techniques. Um, part of that comes out of, uh, like my family being British um, and growing up in a predominantly Cuban neighborhood. Um, part of it comes out of my last name being Chitty in a predominantly Cuban neighborhood. Yeah. Uh -huh. Alexandra Chitty. So, mm -hmm. um, part of that is also you. Like, you found it funny. Um, I think I'm interested in in finding ways to make work that serve as a kind of um, mirror within which you can re be reflected, um, but then also a rock that breaks that reflection so that you're asked, you have to ask questions of yourself as to why it's funny. Why is that funny to you? Um, I think it's, Chicago has a lot of Belushi, hum like we have a lot of humor here and people are a little more relaxed than they are in some other cities. But I also think my gender in particular, it's difficult when you're talking about humor in something like artwork because it can be dismissed as if what you're talking about is not serious. Um, but I use humor in the same way you use harmonies with music because it's exactly the language I need to speak to the audience that I have. Also, uh, it's very poetic. I mean, do you write poetry or like, like the, the little line of what do, what do anthropologists do most, things like that. Yeah, I mean, you saw, I, I'm terrified of using words and like speaking them out loud in front of you. It's awful that you asked me here today to do this. It's really unkind. Um, seriously, but I do, I love words and I do like writing, but I'm, I'm, I'm very dyslexic. And so throughout my life that's meant that I misunderstand people in a way that when I was younger was seen as wrong in school, but as I got older was my strength, is my little superhero power. Um, and in art I can misunderstand so many things and it helps me see it from other perspectives. Um, and it, it becomes a kind of poetry, a personal poetry, yeah. Not yet, I'm working on it. I, w I figured that if I start now in about 20 years, I'll be comfortable with it. So yeah, that's one of the things I want to do when, when I don't want to move my body so much. <laughs> yeah. When you first saw the um, bike sculpture with the- Rachel Harrison, yeah. What did you question about it? It wasn't like there was an element in it that I questioned. I just didn't, it's, it's almost like Do you know what I mean? It's frustrating. You know that someone is trying to commu like communicate something to you and you, you're, you're like really listening hard and you just can't get it. Um, and so if I did that for long enough, you'd kind of begin to actually understand what I was saying without me having to move my hand at all, just because of the way my body moves and because of what you know about me. And it was just an experience for me because I had seen an Ed Ruscha lecture, which I talked about in your class on Monday, where uh, he showed, Ed Ruscha is an artist that does a lot of printmaking and painting. And he talked about things you think you hate. And he showed a picture of an Ed Lichtenstein drawing of Alka-Seltzer dissolving into a cup, like a graphite drawing. And he has had it up in his studio forever, not because he likes it, because he doesn't. And he said, pay attention to the things you think you hate. 
and I never really used the word hate, and I was taught not to, and so it stuck in my mind because I, I was just like uncomfortable to think about. And then I realized that by paying attention to the things you think you hate, you're not actually paying attention to the things you hate, you're paying attention to the things that your upbringing and your culture and your environment has structured you to perhaps hate. And you can start to question everything. Yeah. Firstly, thank you for the talk. Um, and then, do you ever like doubt yourself? Uh, like, can can I do this? And then, being a multitasker, like, do you think you're not good enough in one thing? I like in focusing on many things. What's your name? Uh, Nirman Arpa. Nirman, thank you so much for that question. Do you know the answer to that question? No, no. I I suffer with that. Yeah, me too. So the question essentially was, do you ever doubt yourself? And then being a multitasker, are you ever like, I can't do this? Uh, one certain thing, uh, you know, being a multitasker, can you focus, you have to focus on many things, right? Yeah. Do you think like, I'm not good, uh, completely good enough in one thing? So being a multitasker, you have to focus on many things, and do you ever think I'm not completely good in one thing? The short answer, yeah. Um, I really wish that more people would ask that question, and I wish that more artists would answer yes. Um, if you could peer into the private lives of anybody who's made anything, you're going to find that it is dark. It is so dark. Like how many times, especially like in the middle of the pandemic just recently, where you're like, okay, I'm in America. I, I literally do not get paid for the job that I do here because it is considered a hobby and I have to list it as such on my taxes. And yet every ounce of my being, all of my attention, all of my money goes towards this hobby job. And to what end when there are so many people that need, that seem to need so much more than the thing that I'm providing, it's hard to think bigger and think about, um, why, why you should keep going. Especially when you can see so many other people getting accolades for what seems to be the same job that you're doing. Um, and I think it's probably really, really hard in the time of social media to figure out how to stick to what you're passionate about and how to not uh, get kicked down. But so you build a really good tribe. You build a good friend body, <laughs> people that you can call when you're like, dude, I just um, uh, really don't feel like I can do this anymore. And they're like, hey, have you eaten a sandwich? Why don't you come over? Um, and then the next day, basically, anxiety like that is a form of medicine. It's your body letting you know that something isn't right and you want to change something. So yeah, there's lots of things I'm really not good at. I could list them for you, but it wouldn't do me good like me good, but there are a lot of things I'm not good at. What I do is recognize what those are, and then I figure out, do I have to get better at that? Great, I need to start building those neuro pathways that help me get better at it. It's literally just practice. This is just like every other thing that you do and then get better at. Or I'm like, eh, I really have no interest in that, and so what I'm gonna do is apply to a grant so that I can pay somebody to help me do my finances, because that is not my world. So yes. <laughs> Yeah, I had a fake cherry in my pocket. I put it on the thing. I, I uh, stole it from somewhere because it was just such a beautiful fake cherry. Um, but it was like my power piece. I was like, they don't know that I have a cherry in my pocket. It didn't help a lot, but it helped a little. Who or what inspired you, inspired you to, to become an artist? What inspired me to become an artist? I don't know. If I'm being honest, I don't know. Um, I've always been interested in communicating or trying to communicate. Um, and I tried music, and I really liked it. And I tried theater, and I really liked it. And uh, I tried science, and I really liked it. And um, I didn't know that being an artist was a job. It's part of why I introduced this job as a job, because I just thought it was something people did who had talent. Um, so I'm not really sure the answer to your question. <laughs> It just is where I ended up this time around. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about like leading into anxiety. Do you like use that often? And also, how did you? How were you able to make being an artist a job? Oh, 
Okay, those are two questions. One was talk a little bit about anxiety and leaning into it and... The other one was like, how did you, how were you able to... Make it as an artist? Uh -huh. um, first one is easiest. <laughs> um, uh, the anxiety. How do I, how do I use it? How do you like lean, how are you able to like lean into it? Age. I'm not kidding. Nobody ever really explained this to me. And even when they did, I didn't understand what they were saying because it really doesn't make any sense until you get there. But at a certain age, and as a woman in particular, you just kind of get to a place where you put on these 3D glasses that are just a big outward facing fuck you. And if anybody gets in your way, you move so that you can walk past them. It really is how it is. Like at a certain point, you kind of look around and things like the pandemic help and like big life changes where the world does stuff to your world that you didn't mean to have happen. They help you reorganize and reprioritize stuff that's important to you. I'd say that's how I use anxiety. Um, how do I make it as an artist? Similar to the first answer. Um, but there, there are classes that tell you how to draw and how to use perspective. I never had a class that taught me about how to deal in real estate because as an artist and a sculptor, I need space. And then I also need to learn about my finances and how to use an Excel sheet and how to keep track of how much I spend doing this and how much I get on return. Or how do you get a gallery? And how do you get more than one gallery? And then how do you talk to a whole bunch of people that are in a totally different economic range than you that you don't really even dress like enough for? and try to make sense of yourself there. I didn't take those classes. So basically the way I'm learning to do this is by tripping up a lot and then trying again. And then I asked other people who have done it better than I have and see what they do. I got a therapist who used to be a businessman. That was another trick. Um, and I talked to a lot of students and they ask me really good questions that makes me feel like the advice I'm giving them is probably something I should do too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like you're following your dreams? <laughs> I actually put together a musical for this piece. He asked if I, <laughs> they asked if I was following my dreams. Um, I really do wish I had choreographed something. Um, can I ask why you asked that? Uh, Self-fulfillment. Like, do I feel self-fulfilled or are you wondering if you should follow your dreams? Just how you feel on your personal life of, uh, are you doing what your purpose is? Are you getting there? Okay, you're like, leave me out of this. Um, oh, sometimes. Yeah, uh, it's, it's that thing of like, I don't have anybody that tells me what time to get up in the morning. I, I have to make that happen myself. So I don't know if I, I don't know that I was ever like, you know, six and was like, I want to be an artist. Um, I just really like using this as a way to be in the world um, and to understand what the hell I'm doing here. Um, and so I feel invigorated when I start to figure out the tricks of how to do that. And that feels fulfilling to me. But there are days when you are alone in the studio trying so hard to make a thing and it just doesn't work. And you end up leaving as though, here's where I think I'm not achieving my dream. And it's basic. I can't find my tape measure. I'm in my studio and I know I have a tape measure and I can't find it. And so then my brain starts to go, you're not a real artist. If you were a real artist, you would know exactly where your tape measure was because you would have one of those things on the wall that has an outline of a tape measure and the tape measure would be there, just like how you've seen in movies. But that's not how I lay out my shop. And so I bought four more tape measures and I have them in different spots all around the studio. So when I start to spiral out, I can be like, tape measure? <laughs> where, huh, uh -huh. So I feel like, I feel fulfilled when I figure out how to, how to make up tricks that stop me from tripping up and how to connect to other people. The hardest part about this is that thing where like, 
as an artist, you have to wait for external approval, an institution to invite you to give a talk, or an institution to give you an exhibition. And then if you don't get that, you feel like you're not worthy of that. But you have to figure out why you're doing it in the first place. What's pleasurable for you? What are the parts of it that you really dig? I love learning to make stuff. So I lean into the things that I really love, and I keep doing them until I can share them with other people somehow. So in answer to your question, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.